Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce Sumesh Jha, who is the Luba Professor of Computer Science at Wisconsin. He's been there since 2000. Um, as you may have seen from his CV, he got his uh, PhD from CMU and uh, a Turing Award winner. And he is uh, a very The Turing Awards are not transitive, so I don't... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, he's uh, a fellow of uh, both ACM and IEEE, and he's, his work is um, you know, in security mostly. Uh, and I'm very pleased that we have him here. And so please welcome Ruth Ja. And yep. Thank you. Uh, so it's it's a real uh, real honor to be here, and uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, it's just a stunning campus, especially coming from Wisconsin at this point, it's even more stunning. So, um, a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about, uh, by the way, some of the slides uh, that I'm using, I got from uh, one of my collaborators, Nicholas Papadno, who is uh, going to be at uh, University of Toronto in the Vector Institute. And he asked me to announce that he's looking for students. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, some, and Ian Goodfellow, and Jerry Zhu, who's a machine learning faculty in our department. And a um, lot of the work, especially on the later side, that I'm going to talk about is with Tommaso Drieso and Sanjit Sesha, who were at the other UC, which I had never heard of. Um, so, uh, and so here's, here's kind of what we'll, uh, the, is the plan today. The first part is just going to be uh, almost like a CNN evening news style uh, survey of adversarial ML. Uh, and the, the rest, we will talk about some opportunities that I'm recently looking at with some formal methods folks, almost going back to my roots. My PhD was in model checking. Uh, on how do you, can you connect some of the things, there's some discordant or stuff in what's going on in this community and how you can sort of maybe bridge that uh, back. And that's going to focus on a lot of work that we're doing with Tommaso and such. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, we have a cent NSF center on this topic uh, led by Patrick McDaniel. And uh, so you should, it's called ctml.org. So you, this, this is under that auspices. Okay. Uh, just one thing, I'll be, there are a lot of slides, a lot of skipping around going on. Please, I, I, I do better if I am asked questions as uh, the talk is going on. So please do uh, ask questions as the talk is going on. Okay, so uh, I'm just, this is kind of a perfunctory thing, like how ML is great, ML is solving everything, and, but I don't need to belabor this. It is uh, bringing social disruption to scale. And uh, the story begins that in 2013, a lot of uh, Google brain and AI people were uh, essentially reporting that machine learning tasks were uh, breaking the human, sort of like uh, beating humans at a lot of tasks, you know, like face recognition, actually breaking captures. Uh, and I don't know whether you've seen how weird captures have gotten now, and it's because of this, right? And this, this, all, this makes, makes me really happy. Uh, I have a lot of medical doctors in my family, and my parents still think I should have been a doctor. I'm not a real doctor. So uh, ML is also beating doctors, so I think this, is, this makes me really happy. I'm, I always send, send this slide to my parents. Um, and, um, and, but machine learning is also being used in adversarial settings where the adversary, adversary is kind of tweaking the pipeline. So for example, how many of you have heard that, that Microsoft Tay chatbot where some data was poisoned and started tweeting some weird things? That's, okay, you have. And obviously on sort of self-driving cars, you can sort of mon uh, change videos slightly to get over the YouTube filtering and get your content in. Okay. Uh, and, I mean, this is for the uh, uh, machine learning is also being used in a lot of safety critical systems. The scariest story here is um, there is this uh, big table for when uh, uh, planes should avoid each other. Like, you know, like, oh, if this plane is here, I, I don't, don't know the whole protocol, but people are trying to compress that using neural nets. So, uh, 
you know, that was a scary part. And I just wanted to say that is, uh, since this area has become very hot, there is a lot of sort of this, uh, almost people trying to take a lot of credit, uh, like, hey, I invented the area. No, I invented the area. It's actually not that new. I mean, I had first heard about this in context of SPAN uh, in 2004 while I was, uh, you know, at Microsoft Research visiting one of the collaborators, where obviously they were trying to look at that spam detectors, which were using machine learning, can be actually evaded by very little sort of, uh, you know, by just changing your sort of messages a little bit. So just wanted to, that's more sort of a caveat. Okay, so now getting back into the, uh, let me keep track of the time. So the, here is a mock-up of a machine learning pipeline. So you have your training data, you run your favorite algorithm, you learn parameters, and out comes your model Y. And uh, you know, then you can give your model some test input saying, hey, is this a cat or a dog? And out comes a prediction, right? Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that each of these steps people have attacked. So they have poisoned the data set, they have stolen the model, they have steal, stolen uh, sort of the hyperparameters. So at least in the literature, all the steps can be compromised. <coughs> okay, and people have studied that. Now, just so that we get our notation right, uh, I'm just going to uh, uh, be in the supervised learning setting. So my X is the data label, X is the data, sort of the space of data sets, like think images. Y is the labels. D is the distribution over which that is drawn. And obviously, we don't know that. And hypothesis space is H. So think about weight of the neural network. And L is your loss function, which basically says, on that hypothesis, how good you are. Uh, just, this is just sort of one slide uh, so that I can get the notation right for the rest of the uh, talk. And, Basically, what the learner's problem is that you want to uh, minimize the expected loss plus some regularizer and learn a hypothesis that minimizes that, right? And uh, this will be important. You don't need to know the details. Uh, the most common method for solving that minimization problem is a stochastic gradient descent, where you take a weight uh, and you update the weight uh, according to the negative of the gradient of the loss function. Okay, remember this. Just if you, all those two slides, all you remember is when we do the SGD, we are taking a step in the negative direction of the loss, gradient of the loss function. And after training, what you have is you basically have a function that goes from X to Y. So X is images, Y could tell you whether it's a cat or a dog. And typically, with a lot of these things, there is a soft max layer which gives you a probability over the label. So it tells you it's a cat with probability 0.8, dog with 0.2, and you will predict what is the max of that. Okay? So we will use kind of this, some of this notation, uh, and that's why I sort of just wanted to put this up. Okay, so let's now get a training time attack. So in training time attack, what the attacker does is follows. Um, is that they want to poison your data set so that you learn something wrong. So for example, in spam, they can give you some spam email so that when you learn the spam detector, some benign, uh, some, some of their emails go through. And my favorite example from Wisconsin comes from Jerry Zhu. So this is our lake frozen. And this is here and how many ice days they are. So if you believe in global warming, and if you fit a standard linear regression model through it, the line will look how? Trending downwards. Trending downwards, OK. But let's say, by the way, I just randomly Googled climate denier, and that guy came up. So I just put that in. Uh, so so uh, now you say you're a climate denier. Um, and what you do is you get into my machine, and you just slightly change the data set so that the line sort of looks up or straight. And the point of this was that for sort of linear regression type models, very little tweaks in the data set can actually make the line go up, okay? I kind of like this example. Okay, so here is how you formalize this. So uh, uh, because this is a security talk, it's always Alice Bob. So Alice has a data set of size M. 
Alice gives the data set to Bob. Bob is the bad guy. Bob picks some epsilon fraction. So suppose there are 100 points there. In epsilon is uh, 0 0.10. They put pick 10 bad points of their liking. And they give the union of the good data set and the bad data set back to Alice. OK? Uh, it could also, some people also look at how to replace that data set, but we'll not, I mean, it's kind of the same. And the goal of Bob is to maximize the error. So for example, in a linear regression, you want to sort of maximize the L2 loss, for example. And the goal of Alice is to learn from clean data. Okay? And um, believe it or not, this is actually nothing in computer sciences. You know, everything goes back. So this kind of uh, sort of model has been studied in robust statistics very long back, in the 50s, 60s. And I'm not going to get into that, but um, just sort of some representative papers, if you want to get into this uh, sort of topic, is uh, there is a very nice paper in ICML last year on basically solving this problem for Alice with ve in very high dimensional data. Um, and then there is a data, uh, uh, paper from uh, Percy Liang's group uh, on NIPS on how to uh, do certified <laughs> data poisoning. And then there is some which connects it to some games. And this paper was just in NIPS where it can actually do targeted poisoning. So for example, I can poison the data set a little bit so that, that my image gets classified as a targeted image like Michael Fox. OK? So this is, all, this is how it's going to go. First 15, 20 minutes, I'm just going to give a sort of a short summary of these things. And if you're interested, uh, kind of uh, you know, just follow up those papers. OK, the second was very interesting. I uh, attended a keynote uh, by uh, the, one of the Google founders at one of the <coughs> ML workshop. And they, at least he claimed this was the problem they keeps them awake. So here is the problem. You are Nate Silver. You do your surveying. You know, and everybody knows who Nate Silver is? The 538 uh, the company. Uh, and they had some uh, machine learning model for, let's say, predicting diabetes. And they, because they do a lot of survey, they pick it up. They put it up in the cloud. And then you can put your data in it and then say, OK, you, you are most likely to get diabetes by this much or so on and so forth. And a lot of people are getting into it. This is called machine learning as a service. And let me just put this. And so the idea here is if somehow with very few queries I can steal your model, well, then your business model, business proposition is gone. And this is called model theft. So the idea here is you already have, so the formalization here would be that you have the classifier F, but you get to query these classifiers. Uh, and then you learn another classifier G on those queries so that it is pretty close to F. Okay? So the, the classic paper, at least in security on this, is uh, it's uh, stealing machine learning models using prediction APIs by Trema et al. And uh, we recently uh, sort of put out a paper where we connect model stealing to a framework in active learning. Okay? So by the way, one thing that uh, was very interesting is we showed in our paper is that if you look at the uh, Google has current pricing models for their ML as a service, in those pricing models, it will take you a few hundred dollars to steal a very complicated model, which is not that bad, uh, right? Um, OK, now there is, yes. Well, so suppose that, suppose. But it's not a real deal. It's a Google's problem. So they have a model which they have learned. If I can steal it, more power to me. Why yeah, but I think there are other companies as well. So which are, so for example, there is a social habits company. Their, their, their business model is this. They do a very large survey of people, build some model, and they put it on the cloud so that other people can use it as a service. So in some sense, are you saying there's no breach here? Is that? What you're saying? A company learns a model based on the data they collect. Yes. So that itself was probably, if that was wrong, if I, I, if I learn a model based on the output of the classifier, if that's wrong, then the first thing was also wrong. 
No, it's not a matter of wrong. All you want to do is you want to learn something that is, which, which is close enough to the model that was already there in the cloud using only black box queries. So imagine you have a model out there sitting which predicts how likely you're going to get diabetes. I'm going to start throwing some patients out there to them and then be able to learn the model, uh, sort of a substitute model that's a pretty good uh, approximation of that. And then at least the, 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 the sort of the fear is that, well, their business model is then gone. Why the heck? And you, I will just go and put, uh, put it up and it's some rogue server and people can use it free. At least, at least in that keynote, he claimed this, this is something that keeps them sort of uh, worried. Yeah, I and actually, the here, problem, what? I, I can understand this is a Google problem, but I don't understand this to be a real problem. But I think other companies are also doing a lot of ML as a service. So now I think the key here is maybe this is what you're getting at, is that the query complexity here kind of matters quite a bit. So imagine that you know, in a, for, a, for a model, you can steal with 30, 40 queries. Well, that's really bad, right? Because imagine, I think, I don't know the Google pricing model. That's like 20, 30 bucks. So obviously, what you want to do here is at least raise the, the query complexity enough that you know, there is some deterrent. But, but you might be right. It is not a problem like a breach problem. It's, it's something that. Somebody is using it legitimately, and they're able to run, run, run it. OK, great. OK, now there are some attacks which I don't know how to classify them. Uh, so for example, this is, a, this is a thing which I gave in my graduate, I give my graduate class. You can take videos of Obama saying normal things, and then use current generative models like GANs to change it to saying like, hey, Obama is saying he's a Muslim, okay? And the thing is that obviously the problem here is that you can embed these in social media tweets and so on and sort of spread that. And actually, I'll tell you the class project, this was a class project, not even a paper. I could not tell this was a fake video. So uh, I, I, and I showed it to some of my colleagues, they could not tell it either. And so one thing that I'm almost surprised is, I don't know how Facebook is going to solve this problem. This is something I, Facebook says they're trying to get rid of this, all this face, you know, bad tweets and, you know, videos that are fake, but I don't know how they'll do it. I couldn't tell. Okay? Uh, I'm going to spend a little more time, maybe the next 10 minutes, on these things called test time inputs attacks, because that's where it will connect to the rest of my talk. So if you have questions about the previous one, let me know. <clears throat> OK, so here's a definition from Ian Goodfellow. It says, adversarial examples are inputs to ML models that an attacker has intentionally designed. These are not misclassifications. These are, they were intentionally designed for your model to make a mistake. Okay? And I will show you some examples. So this is, this is a slide that if you work in adversarial machine learning and you don't show, you should be shot. Uh, this is basically a panda. Uh, and I will show you how to generate that noise. And uh, in, in one of the latest models, I think Inception V3 or something, it was classified as a given. And obviously, that's not a given. So the, the game always here is that you want to introduce least perturbation so that to a human, it looks the same but the machine learning model says it's different. Another one, a school bus turns to, uh, to an ostrich. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that what uh, I really like this monstrosity is uh, before this paper, everybody was doing on just images, pixels. So these guys actually did it on a physical stop sign. Now, this doesn't look like a stop sign, but one of the object detectors, one of the uh, was was misclassified this is at a speed limit of 45 or something like that. So the idea was they were able to uh, sort of mount that attack physically. And this is a paper in CVPR from uh, Kevin Keyholt, who's at Michigan, and some people from Don Song's group at Berkeley. Now, my favorite one, because my wife is all into making guacamole these days, homemade, is uh, from, uh, from this uh, MIT team from Anish Atale, who's uh, a tabby cat. <laughs> changes to a guacamole. Uh, 
Okay, and uh, uh, we will talk a little bit more about just DNN models, but uh, people have extended these adversarial examples to other things like other kind of models like uh, nearest neighbors, decision trees, and so on, and gone beyond computer vision uh, to malware and so on and so forth. But I'm, I'm going to mostly focus on more vision applications. So here is just a very small primer. I'm just looking at the time because I need to get into my fifth, is that Essentially, all of what we, and maybe there's some vision people there, we need an oracle that, remember what I said to a human, it looks the same. And that's what that oracle O is. It says that X and X prime is the same, then the oracle gives you the value one. But the problem is that we don't know that oracle. We don't know how a human perception system works. I, I cannot write you a function for O. So what people do in this, this thing is, kind of approximate O by standard norms like L infinity, L1, LP, P greater than 2. Okay? So they're trying to minimize the, the norm of the perturbation. But what you really want is, this is something uh, Ian Goodfellow's blog really talks about. You want actually the first one. You want to generate two images that look same to Michael, but one is uh, but misclassified by the image. But we don't know how human perception works, so we use that as a poor proxy. Um, and then people have considered white box models where you know the classifier completely. Uh, people have considered black box model where you only do black box queries. There are people who have shades of what attacker knows in the middle and sort of the gray box. Okay, so here is the first attack that came out. It was in ICLR 2015. And it's very simple. I mean, this, this was like a one line. How many of you know TensorFlow? It's like one or two lines. OK, here's what you do. So you remember our SGD. What it basically did is it took a step in the negative direction of the gradient of the loss function. You remember I showed you maybe seven slides back. OK, I'm the attacker. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do the opposite. So what I do is I take the gradient of the loss function at the data point, like the tabby cat, and the sign is just, so the sign will be plus one if the gradient is positive, minus one otherwise, and I just multiply by some hyperparameter epsilon. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm just taking a step in the positive direction of the gradient of the loss function. That's all. Okay, that's all this, this is called the fast gradient sign method. So it's essentially opposite of what SGD is doing. And all those things that I showed you, ostrich turning to, on a bus, school bus turning to ostrich, was just generated using that. That's it. OK? So this is a big, so what happened is a little bit sort of a backdrop. So this is when uh, you know, Google was saying, everything is going to be solved by ML. All you guys are going to be, all of us are going to be unemployed because all the humans are getting beaten, blah, blah, blah. And so the thing is, this attack, this paper was like, OK, let's hold on a minute. There is something here we don't understand about DNN models. So this paper was not pitched as sort of adversarial examples as much as sort of saying, look, we need to get, take a step back. There is something weird going on here. And this is from the Google Brain guys. OK, so notice that here I will just multiply this by epsilon in the uh, direction of the loss <coughs> function. But then I don't have any control over what happens, right? So, so for example, uh, Michael might turn into somebody else. But I want to sort of, if, and if Michael doesn't turn into somebody else, then I'm dead. If, if that epsilon didn't work, it didn't work. So um, Alex Madri's group from MIT put out this very small modification of this, which is called the protected gradient descent. And essentially what it does is I will add my fast gradient sign to the image, and if it goes beyond the epsilon ball in some norm, I'll project it back. OK, so this is called PGD. Now, the good thing here is because I projected it back to the ball, I can run this attack again multiple steps. OK, this is, uh, at least in our community, this is known the best uh, sort of attack. If you're going to be in this field, you have to run the PGD attack to show that it worked. Otherwise, it didn't. Okay. All these attacks were uh, misclassification that I don't have any control over the label of what I get. 
So a cat might turn into a dog or a moon or a school bus. But in some cases, you want my cat to turn into a guacamole, right? So you want a targeted attack where you know want the target of the label. And uh, at least what I felt is that we were the first ones who kind of did that. And I'm not going to go into that, but if you are, if you know machine learning, this was basically just a coordinate descent style method. What it basically did is change the pixel that will take me closest to the target and then just circle it around. Okay, this is called the JSMA attack. Okay, there are lots of attacks. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, and so the, the Carlini-Wagner is the targeted attack that's considered the most powerful now, and so on and so forth. And I'm not going to get into that. Yes. Sorry, how do you make the, I mean, because you're not controlling the learner, right? So how do you make it go the other way? Do you have data to make it? Choose? No, no, no. So remember, this, this attack is done post-learner. So your learning process is done. So I have my inception model that you have put out there. So I just downloaded this attack. Yeah? So these are, that's, these are white box attacks. Now, um, we were the first ones we uh, showed to how to do this in a black box manner. And in hindsight, black box meaning all I can do is send it labels and say, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a bus. So it was a dead simple idea. I think I will give Nicholas credit for it. It was very interesting. So what you do is you build, suppose I want to attack inception model. Google's inception model, black box. I'll build a substitute model. And I will train the substitute model by asking this guy black box queries. OK? Once the substitute model is trained, I have the white box. I can go back to my white box attack. Roughly, that's how it works. And the idea here is that people have been studying this. I, I see like NIPS papers a lot. What happens is adversarial exam examples transfer across models quite well. And that's why what I can do is I can just build on a substitute model. Then once I have my white box substitute model, I can run whatever, FCG, SM, P uh, PGD, whatever. That's kind of how the idea works. But there is a very nice paper that, black, that cat to guacamole is from that, from some MIT folks. <laughs> I really like that. So this is, to me, the, the, most, uh, the most powerful black box attack. So let me start up, give you a puzzle. Yes? So was that the, the vector that you add to the image as an attack was very high frequency noisy things? Why you cannot you filter out by just blurring the image or So uh, we will come to defenses. Uh, a lot of those kind of defenses have been broken. So if the attacker knows that you're doing that, they will try to generate an attack image that will take into account that. Uh, I will show you some. Yeah, so unfortunately, a lot of those simple strategies have been broken. But they got their ICML paper out of it, but they have been broken in the subsequent <laughs> conference. Uh, so this is a very simple, there's a, there's a very simple sort of, a, sort of a idea here. Suppose I show you a way to estimate the gradients using just black box queries. Then do you agree that you are back in the domain of FGSM or whatever because you have gradients? So if I show you a black box that can give you gradient information by just using black box queries, then you agree that it's all done? Then we are in our previous step. And there is, there is this whole field in optimization called gradient-free optimization, which, uh, and these guys use that. So essentially what they're do, doing is estimating gradients using black box queries, and then you're back in your model, then you can run whatever attack you want, FGSM, PGD, whatever. So that's what these guys do. But if you're going to work on this black box adversarial attacks, this is the paper to beat, okay? Not our paper, this, this is the paper to beat. OK, coming to defenses. <laughs> uh, this is stunning. So uh, are there any crypto or security people here? I think uh, they, this reminds me of symmetric crypto of 60s, 70s, where people used to put designs out, and the next conference it will be broken. So let me tell you this. So there were seven, there were eight 
these are called pre-processing style defenses, like you know, you apply a filter or you blur the image before classification, all that. Uh, ICLR is one of the major uh, ML conferences. There were eight papers published. In the subsequent ICML, which is four months, I think, uh, I think four months later, uh, the paper that I, which got the best paper award, broke seven out of the eight uh, defenses. Okay? So this basically tells me that we don't understand this space. This is what it, and, and a lot of the defenses were kind of very similar to sort of applying a sort of a filtering algorithm or maybe jiggling the, uh, sort of the noise a little bit. All that is broken, okay? And actually he gave a very nice talk basically saying why security should not be done by ML people. So he was, uh, he gave a very, Nicholas gave a very sort of in your face kind of talk that security people are the ones who like break it. So, um, now, so what people have moved towards now is certified defenses, uh, which are the following that I give you that this is a image of a cat, but then I also give you a certificate that this l prediction is stable in a ball. Okay, and I'm not going to talk about that too much, but people have started developing certified defenses now, motivated by that paper that they don't want Carlini to break their paper. Uh, now, these are the two papers that were not broken. So I think the defense-wise, if I was going to look, I will go into this direction. Uh, these are based on uh, robust optimization approaches. And let me sort of give you, it's a very simple sort of idea. So remember, if we did not, in a normal machine learning, you're minimizing the expected loss in some ways. Now I'm not going to minimize the ex expected loss. I'm going to minimize the max in a ball around epsilon z. So if I take a lot, if I take an x here, a data point, an image, I'm going to draw a ball around it, take the max loss, and minimize that. So why do you think that works? Maybe students, if you have a PhD, don't answer. So think about it, what I'm doing is, I, I take my cat image, I draw a ball around it, and I take the max loss and I'm minimizing that. So if you do that, then basically you're learning something that's stable in that ball. The because the loss function is uh, sort of related to the prediction, right? So the idea is that there's going to be less variation in that ball, and this whole area, this min, is called robust optimization. And this approach by Alex Madri sort of uses that, okay? And uh, John Ducci has a different approach, but it also uses robust optimization. So they actually, this is the MIT group, and this is the Stanford group, and you should go to their open review in ICLR. <laughs> ICLR has open reviews and you see how they are fighting. So that's, that's also interesting to see. So, but we are kind of stuck a bit. How are we, in the SGD, we were able to take the, the derivative of this loss, but now there is this stupid max thing sort of sitting there. How do you take the derivative of that? So there's a very genius approach. What I generally do, this is called adversarial training. You train them sort of, you train your model first naturally, just running the SGD. Now, after that, you adversarial train. So what you do is you take your data point and you run a PGD attack on it. So a PGD attack sort of is trying to do that, right? Attacker is trying to maximize your loss. And so then you run the SGD on actually the attack image. So the, 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 it's really interesting, right? What you do is, Instead of running SGD on your data point, you run it through an attack algorithm, get the attack image, and run your SGD on the attack image. This is called adversarial training in our, in our community. And the idea is that what people are finding is adversarial training is having benefits in other things like attribution and domain adaptation. Are there any vision people in the audience? So domain adaptation and vision means that if I train my network on cars in sunny weather, like Irvine, it should still, your predictor better still work in Seattle, right? 
I mean, you know, that's, <laughs> if it suddenly doesn't start detecting no cars there. So this is called domain adaptation. And the people are finding that even if you don't care about security, adversarial training is having some benefits in other fields as well. Okay, good. Now, people have started uh, uh, doing theoretical explanations. So for example, there's a paper, uh, those all three are brothers, I checked. Uh, they, they, have a, they have a lower bound uh, proof that you cannot get robustness and accuracy at the same time. Um, there is, we have a paper in ICML, there's an ICLR paper which basically saying, hey, maybe if you throw more data at your problem, it will get more robust. So we kind of try to analyze that. There are some people who are basically saying maybe if you run the learning algorithm for a longer time, it will be more robust. But the jury is still up. We don't know. We do not know what, why this happens at all. OK? Uh, and I'm, not, I'm going to sort of skip this. There are a lot of people also working on verification decision procedures for neural networks. So the idea is that if you give it an image, it verifies that around the ball, the prediction doesn't change. Because you know, once the neural network is trained, it's a program, <laughs> right? There is, once you have trained it, it's a program, and it's a loop-free program. So I can then run my verification things and sort of verify all sorts of properties. But unfortunately, they're really slow. I mean, like you would not put in an autonomous driving car, but because otherwise it won't drive. Because if it is uh, sort of verifying each time, uh, it just won't. But people have started working on that. And then people have started working on analysis testing. I'm not going to talk about that. OK, now to my punchline. If you look at the introduction of these papers, all of them say, hey, adversarial examples will cause drones to crash, and you know, cars to crash, and trains will run into each other, blah, 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 right? I mean, like, you, know, you should just look at the, I mean, that's how they motivate <coughs> the paper. Um, and the problem is, all the work, though, is just analyzing the machine learning model in isolation, not in the full control loop of a drone or a car or so on. Okay? So there is a semantic gap between the introduction of these papers and the execution of these papers. And this was not me pointing out. Uh, there is a, the annual conference of control theorists. I sort of gave this talk, the same like similar talk. And they said, what the heck? But this is like, you know, a, a control loop of an autonomous driving car, first of all, has multiple sensors, not just camera. It does all this robust control stuff. I mean, how do you know that these images are actually screwing up the system, not just the machine learning component? So there is a semantic gap here, is that the introduction says something of these papers, and the execution just focuses on the ML thing. And I think it is because, I mean, I'll be honest, Bruce, it's because it's easy. I download some pre-trained model from the web, I know TensorFlow, and I can write a paper, right? I mean, working for a full system is much harder. And that's what we are trying to do. So that's the problem, right? There is a glaring omission from a system of what the specification of the system that is using ML. So for example, to my knowledge, nobody has shown that these drones, you can actually do something to the sort of the image downstairs and it'll screw up their uh, navigation. They're all done in sort of images isolated. Okay? And I, I sort of as so in some sense, this whole adversarial machine learning field needs to be more application aware and see where the machine learning component is being used. And there's a very nice position paper. Uh, by Sanjit Do uh, Sesha, Dorsa Sadiqi, uh, Sadiqi and uh, Shankar Shastri. Um, I, I don't know, it must have appeared somewhere, um, which basically makes this case, <coughs> okay? And so what I'm gonna do for the rest of the talk is motivate some of the work we are doing in this space. So I'm gonna take a mock-up uh, automatic emergency braking system. So imagine there is an ML component that detects whether there's a car on the road or not, that's it, okay? It feeds into a controller, which tells the car to either brake or not, and that goes into the environment, and this, so this is your full control loop, okay? Now the idea is that you want to find adversarial examples here that will not just screw up this guy, but screw up his whole control loop, okay? 
And by the way, I could not have done this work without Sanjit. I mean, those guys have like simulink models. They work with these autonomous cars. And that's why I could do it. Okay, the theme one. So I, these are more sort of work that we are mostly doing. So you will see that they are slightly rough because we are still doing them. So uh, notice that what was the perturbation that you added while doing adversarial ML? You just said, oh, I took a small vector. You constructed this vector carefully, and you added to the image. Well, they are not interested in that. They are interested in allowing more richer transformations than just adding a perturbation, like moving a car closer to a tree, or going to sort of uh, uh, changing the lane of the car, and so on. So what we have been working on is very interesting, is can you allow you specify these transformations in a domain-specific language, and then you search that is there a sequence of these transformations that I, I can apply to my image so that the image will be classified, misclassified. Okay, so let me let me show you this. For example, what this is one of the object detectors that they use. What they did is this the object detector detected was a car, but this it did not detect as a car. Somehow, so the adversarial exam, and if you look at the norm difference between these two, it's very high, right? The, L, the delta norm between this image and this image is very high. So we want to change, allow transformations of not just adding a vector, but add, allowing richer transformations to the image, and then say they are misclassified, okay? Now, there is some... Uh, sort of evidence that that is true, there's a very nice paper that if you just allowed rotation and translation of images, then they can fool some of the state of the art CNNs. So I can take an image and apply some very carefully chosen rota uh, rotation and translation, and it says that it's a different image. So there is some kind of like a, but this is what is more relevant to sort of a full control. Now, anybody see a problem here? Why would this not be easy to do? So remember, our problem is I want to specify my transformations, like moving a car up, moving a car right, putting a tree somewhere, uh, and then say that, is there a sequence of trans transformations to my image where I apply these transformations so that the object detector mis misclassified it? So the problem is if I, everything in machine learning ultimately becomes an optimization problem. And if I want to run this as an optimization problem, all these transformations need to be differentiable, right? Because I need to run sort of the SGD through it. So I have to make sure that all these transformations that I do are written in a differentiably, differentiable programming language, okay? And that's what we are kind of doing. We are working on with a, the, the MIT guys put out a very nice render, a graphics renderer that's actually differentiable. I can differentiate through the renderer. And that's what we are using here. Okay? Good. Uh, so the other thing is, we, as I said, we want to construct adversarial <laughs> examples that actually lead to system level failures, that actually the car breaks you know, breaks. So for example, just to give you a, sort of a, some evidence, uh, this is an object detector. Both of these were adversarial examples. And the object detector said there was no car. But only one of them actually caused a crash. Because maybe it was picked up by a different control logic or a different sensor and so on. So this is what we want. We don't want this. OK? And I'm not going to go too much into it. Uh, there was a very nice Ichikai paper by the same guys which said that if you took, took those images and retrained your network, you got much better. Much better than just throwing more data at it. If you threw these sort of, uh, sort of semantic examples, your controller got much more robust. Excuse me. Yeah. One quick question. Yes. So I might have missed it. So these images you were showing, these are also manipulated, right? Like they're not real yes. images. Yes. Right? So then I'm wondering, in a real car, how would you be able to actually handle what the image, let's say, that the camera has taken? 
No, 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 but I think these are, these are images because we were working in a simulator, but you can imagine that, that what is that thing? Uh, I mean, this, this might happen in real life. So that's a real image taken by a real camera, right? Yeah, yeah. So, what, so, so the, okay. So let me explain to you what, what these uh, these. So we were working on a similar model. They had taken images actually of the road, and what you do it now is now you apply semantic transformations to it and say, okay, what images can I sort of generate that look realistic and your controller breaks down. So this is not sort of this is. Uh, image that we generated by taking a real image and then manipulating it. Right. So but this, you agree that this could happen in real life? I'm not sure, right? Because I mean, like, but it looks like it. But as you said, like previously, to me, like to a human, like it looks correct, but it might not be like a. No, no. But I mean, think about it. If your controller was okay here, mm -hmm. but somehow started breaking over here. You don't think that's a problem? But, 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 but this could be through the flaw of the, of, of the simulation, right? right? The generator. No, no, no. You mean the simulator? The, the, I, I trust those guys that the, they had verified the simulation. You think the simulation model was incorrect? Uh, but, it, but okay, the construction yeah. of the real world, uh, there are some gaps uh, between uh, the, the, the real fine grain, like physical like, tree, and a simulated like, tree in your image. I don't think that was so, I mean, they, they had, uh, from what I remember, they had uh, sort of separated into test and so on. They, you're saying, so the idea is that, I think there are two orthogonal problems here. One is that once you find this image and it says it causes a system level crash, your, your position is that this cannot happen in real life, is that what you're saying? I'm just, I'm just curious whether it can or not, right? Because I like the, this direction that we want to make sure that we can actually break a real system, uh -huh. right, versus just like a machine learning model. So I want to make sure, what, like, so we're going one step further, right? We're looking at the whole control loop, but the image part still like synthesized, right? So it was a real, real image. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I see the, que the question. The question is that I might generate these images using my semantic transformations, right. but you're saying does that actually correspond to a real life scenario? Right. Fair. Fair enough. But I, I think the thing is, uh, a lot of these autonomous driving people, which from what I remember, they do random testing right. Right. by data augmentation. Right. It's still well. a problem that needs to be solved. Yeah, so yeah. Just, yeah. yeah this, this, uh, I guess, but to do this, so definitely, it's better to do real world testing, right? So, so, so just say whether, whether you can find a, like construct a, some malicious, like, real world, like, like. Okay, so that, I, I'll tell you this. Try to work with, so this was uh, done by the, from their collaboration with Toyota. Um, even getting their Simulink models uh, is uh -huh. very hard. I yeah. don't think they will let you test it on a, you want right. to test it on, sort of, they do test it, but what I'm saying is, like if this causes a crash, this right. is a crash in actually the Simulink model. Right. So, so, so actually this leads to my another comment. But I, I don't know, you're saying that you should actually test it in a test, real right. test. So, so the problem is that you are you are not um, trying to study something attacker controllable, right? So, so this is really hard to control. So, so if you are doing something like the like the stickers on the on stop sign, then there's something that, that's yeah. actually easier to be tested in the real world. Yeah, yeah. But so this is this is different. It's all it's saying is, can I generate starting from images? Can I generate realistic looking images using semantic right, right, right. I know, I know, I know, so I that the system? So I I, I agree with you. So what you're I would call this more as a counterexample rather right. than exactly, an attacker. Exactly, exactly. Yes. Yeah, but so maybe that's in the, in the future we'll get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we call it adversarial because we use the same techniques, but you're right. It's not like the attacker is controlling this. This is something you're saying that in a natural image, this can happen and this can control your system. Exactly, exactly. Fair point. Fair point. We will acknowledge you in the next ride. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I'm not going to go into that. What I'm saying is. Uh, uh, if you just use data augmentation, this by putting these images back in your data set, it actually makes the controller better. But let me so now get into sort of something which I am not going to spend too much time in. 
is that a lot of these systems right now out there are using ML as a black box. Is can, I, can you open up the ML uh, sort of wax or give it the softmax output or even maybe the other layers output and actually let design the controllers that are resilient? And we have not, we have done some work around that and we found that uh, you can, you, adversarial robustness does better if you can use model co uh, confidence. But I'm not going to get into that too much because I want to spend the next time doing this. So again, let me get back to it. Can we generate adversarial examples that matter, cause system level failure, and we will call it adversarial example slash counter example. Uh, so here is the, now back, going back to sort of my sort of formal method days. So you're given a uh, formal specification of the system phi in some formalism, like signal temporal logic, and you're given a model of the system, like the anti-log breaking system plus some ML model. And the idea is to find an input for which M does not satisfy the first specification. This is called compositional falsification in this community. Uh, so uh, the idea is how do we treat the ML component? Okay? So as I was telling, sort of looking at Michael, is once you train the model, the ML component is a program, and then we know how to handle programs. We'll, let abstraction refinement loops handle it, then the models are getting really big. So this is going to crash. Okay, this is our verification will not be able to handle it. For example, I was just in Google and they're talking about billion parameter neural networks. Okay? Now the other thing is, you just use adversarial examples as black boxes and you keep throwing these adversarial examples and then I have rest of my loop I know how to handle. That's just a, uh, a, a model. And check that is this uh, example or not. The problem is that there are too many spurious ad adversarial examples. I talked about that. Too many examples that my adversarial example will generate that are actually not going to screw up the system. So I'm going to do, a, do too much of this kind of like, you know, go, going down the loop. I'm going a little fast here because I want to get through to my punchline. So this is what we want to do. This is our system. So what we want to do is we want to verify this control loop without verifying the ML component. Okay? So the idea is this seems like kind of weird, right? We are trying to do verification of the loop. We have the controller specification, but we don't have that. So how the heck do you verify it? So it's like verifying where you don't have this is just given to you as a black box, okay? Think about this as an object detector like YOLO or something like that. So I'm just gonna, and the temporal logic says that the, the vehicle and the object never come close more than a threshold delta. And I'll just give you this slightly, so we are stuck here. We want to find examples that screw up our control loop, but we don't have a spec of so what do we do? Any, any idea? What can we do? We know the spec here. We don't know the spec here. This is some ML model I got off the web, like YOLO or squeeze debt or something. It's a very clever idea these guys came up with. So what they do is, and I'm just going to give you so think about this, if I wanted to verify my ML model, and if I have 50,000 features, I have my state space is two to the, whatever, K to the 50,000. So what these guys have is, they have a system which we are using, which can actually say that you don't have to test the ML model everywhere, just on a very small direction. And let me give you intuition behind it, it's very easy. Suppose in, I always assume my ML model is correct. Like it always says there is a car when there is a car. That's over here. And then I have a second scenario in, uh, where it says the ML model is always wrong. It, when there is a car, it says there is a, not a car. If there is no car, then it says a car. So this is like an optimistic abstraction of an ML. This is like a pes pessimistic abstraction of the ML. Then you, so the, by the way, this is what it says, it's wrong, and this is when it's sort of uh, right. 
Now, if you lay these pictures together, essentially this is the space that you have to actually look at. That's it. Because if your system is wrong, if the ML system was correct and your system is still wrong, then it's done. Right? Just one minute. <laughs> Can I? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just, there are some students who need to leave, so I need to make a quick announcement. Sure, 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 sure. So, so those of you who need to leave, please just exit quietly. The, the password for today is Madison with a capital M. <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> okay? Thank you. <laughs> so, so, uh, so the idea is what they did is they were, they were able to then say that, okay, only s sort of focus on this feature space and only search there. And what they found is they have... The key here is there are a lot of misclassifications in the ML model, but only few of these misclassifications are, will actually screw up your system. Okay? So for example, that one, that's it. In their simulation model, only this one screwed up the system, the others were fine. Okay? Now I'll uh, leave with the grand challenge problem. Remember, here we were assuming that the machine learning model was given to you, post-trained. Let, let's say I want to change my training of the machine learning model so that essentially I want to steer it towards misclassifications that matter. Because you saw from that picture, some misclassifications matter, some don't matter. Can I modify my loss function to do that? So if you are in hardware software co-design, this is like machine learning co-design with your hardware component so that you're steering the machine learning model towards misclassifications that actually matter. And you say, here I don't care about the misclassifications but because I know they will not cause a system crash. This to me is a huge, huge sort of uh, area. And I can tell you this is where the machine learning uh, people are moving. So the idea is that uh, machine learning has all been about getting bet better generalization errors. But if you look at the recent trend, it's about also trying to optimize for other things, like explainability. So there was this very nice paper, I just read it from MIT, by, it's called Self-Explaining Neural Networks, where you train the network so that it also gives you a small prediction, small explanation along with your prediction. So this, to me, is like the holy grail. And I can tell you a lot of people are caring about that. So this is like co-designing ML so that with something about your system so that you are steering towards a machine learning model. All I wanted to say is this is an exciting area, very exciting. In fact, while this talk was going on, there are probably 10 archive papers that just went up. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, I, and I'm not kidding you. So, uh, and so the thing is, I would really, and as I said, this reminds me a lot of symmetric crypto of 60s, 70s, where people are putting defenses out, somebody's breaking. That basically is a big opportunity because it basically tells me that the, you know, we, haven't, we don't know what the problem is here, okay? And so that's, I think if you want, this is, a, this is an amazing paper, a, a sort of a space to get in. And um, like, I, I, I actually really like it. Just to tell you an anecdote before I leave that how fast moving space is, I was giving this talk at I think EPFL, and I had a paper there which said under submission, and somebody from the audience said, hey, just got into ICLR, <laughs> congratulations. So I think this is how fast moving this space is. So you have to keep up a lot, but it is, it is like, uh, it's a very exciting area, I think. And so I'm open for questions, and come, come up and I'll tell you about, you know, what some other stuff that we have been doing. Okay. Thank you.